share my screen uh, 21st. Slide. All right, so let's get started. Um, so just as a reminder of what we talked about on Friday now, uh, we talked about solution dilution, uh, where we use this equation, M1V1 equals M2V2, to figure out how uh, solutions are diluted and what their new concentrations are. Uh, we had some practice problems to go with that. And the last thing we're going to talk about for this PowerPoint is solution stoichiometry. Now, we already talked about stoichiometry in different slides, or different PowerPoint. Uh, just as a reminder, if I have a chemical reaction, um, sure, uh, carbon plus H2 makes... CH4. The stoichiometry is just the numbers in front of my molecules when we balance our reaction. So here it's saying one molecule of carbon plus two molecules of H2 make one molecule of CH4. And we can use this idea of stoichiometry in aqueous chemistry as well. Because stoichiometry is simply saying, you know, how many reactants do I have to use? How much product will I get? And we can use those same ideas when it comes to ideas like molarity. Remember, molarity is simply moles divided by liters. And we talked about that on Friday as well. So let's see how we can use uh, stoichiometry and solution chemistry at the same time. So I'll do A, and then I'll let you try and do B and see if you can make sense of it. All right, A. So here's a reaction. Here's my balance reaction. I already have my stoichiometric coefficients in front of all my molecules. And so if I have... 250 milliliters of 2 molar NaOH, how much phosphoric acid, H3PO4, so how much? Um, so when reading these questions, right, it's very easy to get overwhelmed. So that's why I'm uh, highlighting or underlining the information that's critical for us to solve. And how much means we should get a volume. We should get an answer in liters or milliliters or something like that. That's what um, how much means in, in this respect, right? So how much H3PO4 must I use to completely react it with NA, NaOH if my H3PO4 has 1.25 molar or molarity? And what is also a good tip I find when I'm doing um, word problems is that um, I'll just rewrite the variables outside of the words um, because looking at the sentence can be confusing. So I find it helpful if I just say, I have NaOH, it's 2.0 molar, I'm using 250 milliliters. I have H3PO4, right? This is 1.25 molar. What volume do I need to react it with NaOH, right? That's the essence of this question. That's exactly what we're asking. And so we can use um, stoichiometry to do this. Now, how to start this question? There's a lot of ways you can start it. Um, and really, well, let me just start it the way I was going to start it. So I have 250 milliliters. I want to know how many moles of NaOH are in these 250 milliliters. The way you convert between a volume and moles is molarity. 
So big M converts volume in moles. That's what we use molarity for, all right? So molarity is moles divided by liters. Here I start in milliliters. So molarity can also be moles per 1,000 milliliters. Because remember, one liter equals 1,000 milliliters. All right, so my molarity, for every 1,000 milliliters of NaOH I have, that's two moles of NaOH. Milliliters of NaOH have canceled out. My units are now moles of NaOH. So when doing the train tracks, always be aware of what unit you are in. Knowing what unit you're in will make your life so much easier. All right, so I'm in moles of NaOH right now, and I'm trying to get to H3PO4. So when switching between one molecule and another, that's where stoichiometry comes in, and we need to be in moles for that. So our balance reaction says, for every three moles of NaOH, I use one mole of H3PO4. That is what these numbers say. That is what stoichiometry is. All right, so my units of moles of NaOH have canceled out. Now I'm in units of moles of H3PO4. And remember, I'm trying to figure out a volume. I wanna figure out how much. Right now I'm in moles of H3PO4. The way to convert between volume and moles is molarity, right? So my molarity of H3PO4, for every 1.25 moles of H3PO4, I have one liter of H3PO4. Moles of H3PO4 cancel out. My unit is now liters of H3PO4. I'm in the correct unit, which probably means I did my train tracks right. That's also an advantage of this method. If I end up in the unit that I was looking for, so this can be milliliters or liters, I'm good to go. So now what we have to do is multiply across the top, take everything divided uh, on the bottom. And I believe you should get, you need one, uh, 0.13 liters of H3PO4 for this reaction. That should be your solution. Um, so using that, using what I wrote out in A, see if you can do the same type of logic for B. Where in B, I give you amount of HCl. I'm telling you how much I reacted with MgOH2. I want to know what the molarity of MgOH2 was. So see if you can figure that out. Um, if you have questions, please let me know, but we'll do that for a couple minutes. And remember, I'm giving you this time to try and work through those problems because you will see something like this on test two. I almost guarantee I will pick a problem like this for test two.
And as always, if you get an answer, uh, let me know and I'll tell you if you're on the uh, right track. Um, but I hope at least everybody was able to read that sentence, right? And pull out the information that, that is needed. So HCL, I give you a molarity. I give you a volume. MGOH, two, I give you a volume. I'm asking what molarity. So your answer should be in molarity. At the end, at the end of your train tracks, you should somehow, some way, end up with molarity. Remember, molarity, big M, is moles divided by liters. So I do have a question is that um, if, if you do this conversion and you end up in moles, how do you get to molarity? Good question. So if you do the train tracks and your flash unit is in moles, what I would do is I would calculate it, get your answer in moles, take the volume of MgOH2 that's given in the uh, question, to get your molarity. So you take your moles divided by 1.75 liters to get molarity. It's not, it's a similar form to density, but it's not. So density, is uh, grams, it's a, so density is weight divided by volume. Uh, molarity is moles divided by volume. Moles is a, a, is a amount of stuff. Weight, it's similar, but it's not the same. Um, yeah, so it's moles divided by volume. Density is weight divided by volume. Um, it's not 0.08 molar. You can get, it should be 0.08 moles, but that's not molar. Uh, I have stopped at two moles of HCl. I don't know if that's correct. Uh, not quite. Um, so let me work through this where I've, I'm seeing some progress being made. Um, so let's, let's, um, see what I get now that I have some answers coming in. All right. So when doing this, your first thing is I need to get to moles. So when using solutions stoichiometry, 
get to moles because moles is the only way I can convert between one molecule and another. So if I have 1.25 liters of HCl, for every one liter of HCl, I have 0.125 moles of HCl. So if I just look at my units from my first conversion, I'm converting 1.25 liters of HCl to moles by using my molarity. My liters of HCl have canceled out, I'm left in moles of HCl. Now that you're in moles, you can switch between any molecule you want in the equation using stoichiometry. Here, I'm interested in MgOH2. Right? So if I look at my equation, for every two moles of HCl I have, that's one mole of MgOH2. Moles of HCl cancel out, and my unit is moles of MgOH2. Right? So here I'm in moles of MgOH2, and I really don't need to do the train tracks anymore. I'm not done yet, but I'm almost done. Um, so if I do this calculation, multiply everything on the top, divided by everything on the bottom, I get 0 0.078 moles of MgOH2. Sorry, I have to... ran out of room there. Now, moles does not equal molarity, right? Molarity equals moles divided by a volume, or moles divided by liters. It's actually always liters, right? So I have moles, so I just have to take my answer, divide it by my liters, and when I do that, I should get 0 0.0446 big M. It should be three sig figs, 1.25 is three sig figs, 0.125 is three sig figs, 1.75 is three sig figs. So your answer should be three sig figs. That, whoops, that point O's, it should have been point O seven eight zero. But yeah. One point, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. 1.75 liters, my bad. Yeah, it's not 1.45, that's me me not reading my handwriting correctly, 1.75. And I see that some people got like 0 0.0457 and 0 0.0456. So it's possible I did like a slight calculation wrong. So um, if you would put like 0 0.0457 on the test, I it would probably be, um, um, given correctly because you can't get that close without doing the right thing. Um, so I'm a little bit forgiving on that. So you had two moles of HCl on the top and not on the bottom. Yeah, so when doing the train tracks, make sure that um, units are canceling out correctly. Um, a unit on the top and unit on the bottom, they cancel out. Um, you you wouldn't get partial credit if you, like if I had the answer being 0 0.0446 and you put like 0 0.0457, that is usually in the realm of being close enough that it would be like, yeah, you get full credit on something like that. Um, usually I will go maybe like a percentage in either way. You get 1% like margin of error. Um, any other questions about this? All right, so I just hope this was a good example also of like showing you, um, you know, how we're building on each other in chemistry. We're using this idea of stoichiometry that we learned in another section adding it to our molarity, which we learned in this section, and showing those how they work. Um, we could also go one step further to, I give you just like um, the equation in A on balance, and I say balance it 
or I don't even say balance it. I say in this equation, you know, what's going on. Um, I would probably tell you to balance it though. Um, Cause I like to be a little nice like that. All right. So that's the end of this PowerPoint. Let's get to today's PowerPoint. Today's PowerPoint should be relatively quicker because I don't think, let's see. Yeah, there are no, there's no math today. One of our rare times where you don't need a calculator. This is all um, visual stuff, reading tables. Let me pop this open. All right. Even though it says Friday, it's today. All right. So what we're talking about today is dissolving molecules in water. All right. So first, let's just look at water itself. So water is um, has has two different like charges on it. Overall, water is a neutral molecule. However, the electrical charge of water is not even over the molecule. Oxygen is partially negative. So oxygen has more electrons than hydrogen. So hydrogen is partially positive. So when we look at a water molecule, the electrical charge is not evenly distributed. Oxygen has more electrons, which makes it slightly negative. Hydrogen has more protons, or sorry, less electrons rather, I should say that, less electrons, which makes it slightly positive. And why that matters is that when we dissolve ionic compounds in water, they will break apart. So table salt, sodium chloride. Sodium is a metal and it's a cation. Remember, cations are positive. Chlorine is a non-metal and it's an anion. What happens when you put salt in water is that the positive sodium gets attracted by the negative oxygen of water. The negative chlorine gets attracted by the positive hydrogens of water and they will dissolve, they will break apart. Now, when you have dissolved ions in water, those dissolved ions are called electrolytes. So next time you are at HEB, Walmart, whatever your favorite grocery store is, and you see those um, like Powerades, those drinks that say, now with more electrolytes. What that means is now with more salt. So an electrolyte is simply a salt dissolved in water. Um, so if you have salt dissolved in water, it's called an electrolyte solution. If you don't have a salt in water, you have non-electrolyte solutions. Now, when we're talking about electrolytes and non-electrolytes though, um, the electrolytes have to be charged, right? So sugar, sugar also dissolves in water because sugar has a lot of oxygens and hydrogens and they form what's called a hydrogen bond. It's a non-covalent interaction between, um, in this case, oxygen and hydrogen. However, sugar is a, uh, has only covalent bonds. Covalent bonds don't break in water, unless you're an acid, but for the most part, covalent bonds don't break in water. So if you have sugar water, that is non-electrolyte. And what happens is that if you have electrolytes in water, you conduct electricity. If you have non-electrolytes in water, you don't conduct electricity. And this is something I found surprising when I was first studying this. If you were in a pure water solution, that is 
nothing dissolved in water, you are safe from electricity. Like you could drop an, a toaster in there plugged in, water does not conduct electricity. So you would be safe. Water is an insulator. What does conduct electricity are all the ions dissolved in water. So pure water, which is actually incredibly hard to make. It takes a lot of money, a lot of energy, but pure water does not conduct electricity at all. Stuff dissolved in water, salts, do conduct electricity. That's why water is so dangerous with electricity because it's always full of salt. You can like never get the salt out of it. Um, some other fun facts, uh, pure water, nothing dissolved in it, doesn't taste like anything. So if you drink a glass of pure water, has no flavor. It would just feel like wet, a wet liquid, flavorless wet liquid going down your throat. And pure water will kill you because all the ions in your cells and your body would come out of your body and go into the water. And so drinking pure water is actually um, incredibly deadly. Um, but like I said, it, it takes so much money to make a, a glass of pure water. I'm um, like a just like one glass of pure water is probably like $8,000 to make. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, what makes a substance a salt? Salt is metal plus non-metal. So like NaCl, um, Mg, uh, F2. You got your metal and your non-metal in an ionic bond. That's a salt. All right, so any questions about the information on this, on this slide? All right, so let's go on to um, some problems to test our understanding of everything I just said then. All right, so I have four compounds. All four compounds will dissolve in water. Which compounds will conduct electricity? I believe I have a poll for this. I do. Been a while since we've done one of these, but I put up a poll. So tell me, each one of these compounds, current means it will conduct electricity, no current means it won't conduct electricity. So tell me if we're gonna conduct electricity or not. And remember, a, a salt, I just said it on the last slide, but I'll rewrite it. Salt, metal plus non-metal, metal, they have ionic bonds. So you might have to bust out your periodic table if you don't remember what, what is a metal and a non-metal. Remember, metals are on the left side, non-metals are on the uh, right side. So we can determine if it has a current based on if it's in an in a ionic bond or covalent bond. Uh, basically, if there's any ionic bonds present, those will break in water. When you break an ionic bond, 
you're going to form charged compounds, cations and anions. Cations and anions uh, conduct electricity, right? Those are the things in water conducting electricity. Water itself does not. So basically, yes. Do we have ionic bonds? If ionic bond conduct electric electricity, if not, no conduct electricity. So do like another, I don't know, 30 seconds on this. All right, let's see what we have here. So number one, we have cesium chloride. Cesium is a metal. Chlorine is a non-metal, which means we have ionic bonds. So that will be current. Next, we have CH3OH, um, methanol. All of these are um, nonmetals. So they're all covalent bonds. So the way I taught you would be no current. Um, full disclosure though, CH3OH is a slight acid. So a very small percentage of the time you'd make CH3O negative charge, hydrogen plus charge. So in reality, methanol has very little current, very, very little, but we're just gonna say either it has a lot of current or no current. So this is no current. I'm really, I'm really looking here, you know, ionic bond or, or covalent bond. So we're gonna stick to no current. Here's actually what's happening in reality though. Uh, potassium phosphate. Potassium is a metal. Phosphate is a polyatomic anion, all nonmetals. So this is current. Uh, phosphate pentafluoride, uh, all nonmetals. So no current. All right. So if it's only covalent bonds, no current. If it's ionic bonds, current. So for pure water, did someone sacrifice themselves to know how it would taste like? Honestly, the way I know that is because I was watching a show on the Discovery Channel in a hotel, like after 18 hours of driving, because I was driving from Texas to Michigan. And they had that segment on pure water and this guy was in a lab and he took a, like a small little drink and he was describing it to the, uh, to the audience. So that's, that's how I know about this whole pure water tastes like nothing. It costs like $8,000 and it will kill you. Nonsense. Watching the Discovery Channel in the hotel randomly one day. But any questions? What happens to your cells when you drink pure water? Sure. So your cells are full of ions, they're full of salts. And if you have water with no, no ions in it whatsoever, um, what's going to happen is that usually the ions can't leave, right? So the ions, for the most part, well, let me get a little more technical. The ions can leave if you have um, pumps um, from proteins. They're called ion pumps. And usually these are running all the time. And there, there's a couple different things that will happen. One, uh, when, you're, when your cell is using the ion pumps, all the ions will go into the pure water and they will be carried away. Like they'll just 
move away from the cell and they won't be replaced by anything. And so your ion pumps will break down. And without ion pumps, you can't move your muscles. Without moving your muscles, you can't breathe or really think. And so you'll die that way. What would also happen is that um, water will rush into your cells and your cells will burst. So your red blood cells, um, when drinking this stuff, um, they, would, uh, they would burst. Without red blood cells, you can't carry oxygen to the other parts of your body. Without carrying oxygen, you would suffocate. So a multitude of ways that will go bad for you. Yeah, it can take, probably take calcium for your bones as well. Yeah, it was, it was all from the name of science for that expensive drink, though. So if you keep drinking pure, like if you take like one drink of pure water, that won't kill you. If you drink like, you know, 32 ounces of pure water, that you're going to be in for a very bad time, a very bad time. Um, but yeah, like one drink won't kill you. Um, you might get a little sick, but it won't kill you. And the water has to be, yeah, like without any ions, which is very hard to do, but it's going to take the ions from your body. Do ionic or covalent bonds determine if the compound is going to act on an acid or a base? Like on the quiz, it wanted to know how KOH be behave when dropped in water. Um, so if your molecule has OH in it, it's going to be a base, um, like all the time. Um, if it has like COOH, it's an acid. Basically, for the most part, if there's an H written in front, that means acid. If it's just an OH, it means base. Any other combinations of like oxygens and hydrogens, it's usually acid. Yes, science can be pretty crazy. Alkaline water is the biggest scam in the world. I'll say that right now. Anyone who's spending $3 a bottle on alkaline water, you are wasting your money. Because remember, your stomach acid is like a pH of one to two. What do you think alkaline water does when it hits your uh, stomach before it's absorbed in your body? It becomes non-alkaline anymore. So if you have a stomach ache, by all means, drink alkaline water. It'll probably help you have uh, get rid of your stomach ache. If you're drinking alkaline water for like any other health benefits, you are buying very expensive water that's not doing a thing for you. Uh, the H plus the TUH in water made in an acid. Um, not OH, OH is a base. I would not drink distilled water. Um, distilled water is um, a lot of the ions have been taken out. Not as much as the pure water that I have said. Um, but um, if you're going to, I wouldn't drink distilled water. It's, it's probably doesn't taste as good. Um, yeah, it's usually you use distilled water for machines um, or science experiments. I, I wouldn't recommend drinking it myself. Um, I used to use distilled water for making coffee, but I would put salt in that water before making the coffee to like enhance the flavors. Um, but yeah, I, usually you don't want to drink distilled water by itself. Yes, uh, arguing science with people who don't want to listen is, is frustrating. Uh, reverse osmosis with minerals added. Yeah, that'll, that'll make good water. Um, reverse, like especially in San Antonio with so much um, oh, carbonate buildup, you'll notice like if anyone boils water, like I boil water for tea, so does my wife, you'll notice that you get white junk on the bottom of your tea kettle or whatever, pots and pans. That's um, carbonate, limestone, yeah. It's not bad for you. It just looks gross and can change the taste of the water. So one way to get rid of that is you use like reverse osmosis and then you just put some minerals back in for flavor and stuff like that because water itself is tasteless. And it's the minerals which give it taste. So that was about six minutes on the taste of water, which is 
all very good, learning about the practical uses of chemistry. Um, but let's, let's um, move on, though. Whoops, did not mean to write. Let's move on to our next thing. All right. So now we're going to learn which compounds are soluble and which ones are insoluble. So not all ionic compounds are actually soluble in water. Um, some will crash out, of, crash out in water. And so this table will um, tell you, you know, which combinations are soluble and which ones are insoluble. Um, so I will give, whoopsies, sorry, did not have my pen on, I had my pointer on. I will give you this on the test. So no need to memorize this table. What I want you to do is learn how to read it. So I'll do A, and then I will um, put up a poll to do B, C, D, E, and F. And simply, I want you to read this table and tell me if it's soluble or not. So silver nitrate, AgNO3, we look on this table and we look for any of these ions. We're looking for silver or we're looking for nitrate. And you see nitrates right here. And our table says, this is soluble except, and there are no exceptions. So any molecule or any um, element that is paired with, paired with nitrate will be soluble in water. So this is soluble. All right, so B, C, D, E, and F, I want you to use this chart, and on the bottom here, it's CO3, 2 minus, PO4, 3 minus. Um, so that's on the bottom here. And the exceptions for these, since I know it's probably cut off, exceptions are Li, Na, K, and H4. All right. So read that table, see if you can figure out what is and what isn't soluble. Let me get a um, new poll up here. Yeah, water can take the taste from its container. Um, one of the problems with plastic bottles is that eventually over time, some of the plastic will leach into the water. Um, and so you might be drinking micro amounts of plastic from plastic bottles. Water is very good at dissolving stuff. Now that's actually, a. now that we're just going on water in the environment, that's a big problem. Um, so like a lot of beauty, I don't know if they do this anymore, but like there was beauty products that had like those, those scrubbers in it, where like it can exfoliate your skin by having all that rough stuff. Um, sometimes that rough stuff is just microplastics. And what happens is when you, um, you know, wash your face or whatever, and then you take those microplastics and you just put them down the drain, those are going into the ocean. And then small organisms eat that. And then bigger organisms eat a lot of those small organisms and so on and so forth. And then you just get fish with like a bunch of plastic in their gut, a bunch of heavy metals in their gut, which makes it really bad for us when we eat said fish. So just some fun environmental facts.
All right, so we are round, uh, winding down time. I do want to get to the next slide because the next slide doesn't take too much time either. So I'm going to end this poll and just go through the results uh, really quick here. Uh, PbC2H3O2, so lead acetate. Um, and if we look at acetate, there are no exceptions. So anything paired with an acetate is always soluble. So lead acetate is soluble, making tasty lead ions that are super poisonous for us. Uh, potassium nitrate, KNO3. Again, NO3, anything paired with NO3 is soluble. So it's soluble. Uh, ammonia, ammonia sulfite, NH4S. All ammonia compounds are soluble, which is a big problem with farm runoff. Um, so I'm originally from Michigan. I used to live right on Lake Michigan. What happens when you use a lot of fertilizers, uh, which have ammonia in it, uh, they go right into Lake Michigan. All the algae eat it. The algae grow and grow and grow crazy amounts. They take all the oxygen from the water, then all the fish die. And there's been a couple of summers where you just have hundreds of dead fish on the beach and it's super gross. Um, but that's ammonia. Uh, lithium sulfite. So anything with lithium is soluble. So that's soluble. Silver chloride. Chloride is soluble unless it is pair, paired with silver. So you cannot dissolve silver sulfite, and I have untitled option two. I look like I forgot to make that one. So uh, silver chloride is uh, not soluble. All right, our very last thing is the same idea, but this time what we're doing is that you are mixing solutes. So if you put these four solutes, in a container, like you put, you just pour four ions in a water container, right? What molecule is going to crash out? And when you see the uh, word precipitate, that means form a solid in water. So what would be your solid? And at B, it's the same idea. Mix sodium hydroxide and aluminum sulfate what will you make that's a solid? And I, I helped you out with this one. So let me, um, let me get a new poll up here. I've kind of limited your choices. Um, so in A, what you're doing is you're just putting the positive and a negative together. You're so you only have four different compounds you can make from mixing uh, lithium, uh, carbonate, magnesium, and chloride. Tell me which one, based on our chart, is insoluble. Then in B, we're mixing two molecules to make two new molecules. Tell me in B which ones are insoluble. And this will be the last thing that we do. So I'm just going to let people have like a minute or two. Um, then I'll go straight into the answers. Remember, use the table because right now in A, all four answers are even, which look at the table, look at your exceptions. What is soluble in the table? What's not soluble from the table?
All right, since time's winding down on the end polling here in a minute, um, just by looking at the answers though, seems like we need to focus on how to read a table, right? Um, so I would definitely take a couple minutes out of your day and just sit down with table 4.1 because you'll have it on the test, but you need to know what it means and what it says, all right? So end polling, share results, right? So which one of these four compounds will form, uh, will form a precipitate? If we look at our table, we see anything with lithium is soluble. There are no exceptions. So lithium, so anytime you see a compound with lithium, you should say to yourself, this is soluble. This will not form a precipitate. So lithium chloride and lithium carbonate are soluble. They will not form a precipitate, which only leaves magnesium carbonate and magnesium chloride. So we go to chlorine and we see it's soluble unless paired with silver, mercury, or lead. Well, magnesium's not any of those. So magnesium chloride is soluble. And we can just double check that the answer is MgCO3 because CO3 is insoluble unless paired with lithium, sodium, potassium, or ammonia. Magnesium's not one of these, so the answer is MgCO3. Same idea for two. Um, if we look at SO4, SO4 is soluble, except when paired with strontium, barium, lead, silver, or calcium. Um, there are none of those, it's sodium. So sodium SO4 is soluble. So the correct answer is aluminum hydroxide. Things with OH are insoluble unless paired with lithium, sodium, potassium, nitrate, or calcium, strontium or barium. Aluminum is not one of these, so when paired with OH, it is insoluble. So let's make sure um, we know what this table is saying, make sure we can understand uh, this table. Uh, how is lithium soluble? I, I thought lithium would blow up in water. Lithium does blow up in water if it's pure lithium. If I had nothing but lithium and it's solid form, solid lithium and throw that in water, it blows up. Lithium with any other compound though, doesn't release that much energy when dissolved, so it won't blow up. It's the same reason why if you ate uh, pure sodium or breathed in pure chlorine, you would die. But sodium chloride together, since they're mixed, they have different properties and so they make salt, which if you eat too much of that, you will die too, but you know, takes a lot. Yeah, I know there's some problems with where the pole is and it's hard to move it sometimes. Um, but yeah. Okay, so that's the end of today's lesson. If you have any questions about what we went over, please let me know, email me. Um, I'll put a homework up. I'll put this video up. Otherwise, see everybody hopefully on Wednesday. Uh, have a good one.